you know, we trust rules, not rulers with Bitcoin. Yeah, oh, I like that expression. Rules, not rulers. Hi everyone, we're here at the Canadian Blockchain Summit, our very first interview of what promises to be a very exciting series. I'm here with Dave Bradley of Bitcoin Well. I'm going to let him introduce himself in just a second. Uh, as I said, here in Calgary, exciting events, the first pan-Canadian uh, Canadian Blockchain Summit, so lots of excitement and um, yeah, I'm going to leave it over to Dave to introduce himself and Bitcoin Well in one minute or less. Sure, thanks. I'm uh, Dave Bradley. I am uh, widely known as the strongest and best looking Bitcoin entrepreneur in Canada. <laughs> uh, beyond that, I've been in Bitcoin since 2010 and I've founded a few different companies in the space, including Bull Bitcoin, which is probably the largest and longest serving Bitcoin brokerage in Canada. Uh, I'm currently the uh, chief revenue officer at Bitcoin Well. Uh, Bitcoin Well is primarily a Bitcoin ATM company with a new online product launching. And our mission is to make Bitcoin accessible and useful to normal people on a day to day basis. Well, that was uh, very clear, very to the point. You've obviously practiced it a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, you're clearly an OG, by the way, if you've been around since 2010. Uh, borderline wondering if you're not Satoshi. But uh, <laughs> So in 30 seconds, you chose what is Bitcoin? Why does it exist? What does it serve in 30 seconds? Yeah, so Bitcoin is money. It is not an investment. It's not a stock or a bond. There's no yield. There's no rights that are conferred by ownership. And the whole point of money is to take the value that you create with your time and store it to use it later, probably somewhere else. And dollars are terrible for that because if you're trying to store your, your value that you've created with your time in dollars, while you're doing that, the government's printing more and your dollars are becoming less scarce and therefore less valuable. So Bitcoin's better because no one can print more. That's pretty simple. I, I have to give it to you. That's probably one of the simplest explanations I've had. We could go more technical, of course, but we're going to do a lot of these. So thanks for your uh, your, your input there. So um, so we're here at a, at a pan-Canadian conference on blockchain, crypto, Web3, etc. Why don't you give us your quick outlook on the Canadian market? <coughs> but of course, this is a borderless market. So also what's happening in the world, uh, in the world of crypto. Yeah, I mean, Canada is pretty exciting lately. There was just a... Uh, Bank of Canada study uh, that said that uh, I think it's 13% of Canadians now own Bitcoin. Uh, that mirrors a study that we did last year in 2021 as well. Uh, our study said 14% and that puts us like pretty firmly, I think, in the top spot worldwide for global uh, ownership and adoption. You mean more than certain countries like Nigeria, what we hear about a lot, or, or other developing countries? Yeah, I mean, we, we've got very different use cases here than in Nigeria. So in Nigeria, they're mainly using Bitcoin as a way to get around capital controls, as a way to get around controls in the banking system, and just fill gaps in the traditional financial system yeah. that uh, are not being served. Um, our traditional financial system, as far as making payments in Canada, is really good. Like, it's very convenient to, like, tap your phone and pay for something. Uh, but like I mentioned in the previous answer, the dollar is not very good. So if you're trying to store value, it's a terrible way to store value. So most Canadians who are getting into Bitcoin are looking to uh, either use it as that store of value and hedge against inflation, or in a lot of cases, they, people are treating it like an investment. And in a lot of ways, it works like an investment because as the dollar becomes less valuable and less scarce, Bitcoin stays the same and they're able to cash it in later for more dollars. Let me jump in on this. So I saw recently, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the dollar is the strongest currency. Everything has been trading sort of uh, downward compared to Bitcoin, uh, sorry, compared to the dollar, the US dollar that is, uh, not the Canadian dollar. But the only thing, or one of the only things that has actually been beating the dollar is Bitcoin, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, and we're in a, we're in a bear market part of the cycle and we're still beating the US dollar right now. Yeah. It's pretty evident that pretty much every fiat currency is in sort of a race to the bottom. They're all trying to print as much money as they can to devalue the debts that they hold that are all denominated in their own dollars and uh, continue to fund the unsustainable spending that pretty much every government in the world has launched in the last two years. And so it's not a good time to be holding fiat currencies anywhere in the world. And the US dollar being sort of like the global powerhouse has fared a bit better, but really it's it's on the edge of a cliff as well. Yeah, 
So looking at the global market, what should our viewers sort of track? It's, it, there's so many metrics from the on-chain stuff to the more macroeconomic stuff, what's happening locally as well, I suppose, matters. Um, what are you sort of keeping an eye on, like, regardless of what day of the year or yeah, <laughs> what I mean, you're doing? I mean, I tend to try to take a, like a, a big picture view Kay. because there's a million different ways that people will do technical analysis or, or search trends or whatever else they feel is going to drive the next big pump. Yeah. And when it comes right down to it, none of that stuff really matters. Bitcoin is the only completely free market uh, product in the world that can be traded anywhere, 24 hours a day. Um, anyone in the world can pretty much get into trading Bitcoin and make a bet on the price. And so there's really no predicting what it's going to do at all in the short term. It's very volatile, very volatile, and it's going to continue to be, I think. The way that I would look at it is that like 10,000 foot view where there's never been a time where you couldn't invest in Bitcoin, wait five years and be massively up. So it's not a good way to store money that you need soon. It's not a good short term investment, but it's the best way to store value long term and the best way to hedge against the madness of the world and all the money printing we're seeing. And right to now. be clear and to expand a bit on what you're saying, you're clearly saying as well that Bitcoin is unique, not just as a store of value in the world, but also very much the only crypto that yeah. has those features. Yeah, and I, like, like I mentioned, the most important factor of Bitcoin is that no one is in charge, no one can decide to print more. And that's not true for every single altcoin. Um, you know, there, there's literally a conference call with Vitalik and his buddies to decide what the supply of Ethereum will be. And you're just moving that money printing and uh, decision making about the money supply, you're moving that from the central bankers to the basement nerds. And I don't know which group you would really trust, but the whole point is not that you want to trust someone. Mm. You know, we trust rules, not rulers with Bitcoin. Yeah, oh, I like that expression, rules, not rulers. Um, building on, on that question too, um, a lot of people would see altcoins and Ethereum in particular as a platform technology, sort of open source, a lot of things can be added on it through layer twos, a lot of functionalities. Can you compare Bitcoin to that? Well, you know, there, there's a lot of techno babble um, that Ethereum really spearheads that uh, they lead uninformed investors down paths saying they're going to build things that either they never plan to build, they're not able to build, or are not helpful to build. And that's been the story of Ethereum where about eight years in, we don't have a working product really. It just switched to proof of stake, which is a hilarious mess. And really there's there, not a single promise sold by the company that sold this illegal security has been fulfilled in these last eight years. So there's not really any comparison between Ethereum and, and Bitcoin or really any other altcoin and, and Bitcoin. And in terms of use cases that could be added on top of Bitcoin? Yeah, well, there might be. Um, so far, the only use case we've seen with Ethereum are uh, different ways to take money from other people. So we have ICOs, NFTs, all the DeFi stuff, all the gambling, all that is just different ways to separate people from their money. And the only thing that Ethereum actually accomplishes is it brings in a massive user base of users that are already easily fooled by Technobabble. We know that because they're Ethereum users. And so if you want to steal money from people who know less than you about cryptocurrency, Ethereum is a great platform to do that. There hasn't yet been another use case that is necessary um, that has evolved on Ethereum, but if it ever happens, like these are open source projects. So if something useful ever gets built on Ethereum, someone okay. will just build it on Bitcoin and it'll be better on Bitcoin, whether it's as a layer two or, or, or using the, the technology in layer one now, it'll be better because it'll be closer to the actual settlement layer. I was, be, gonna be I was gonna challenge you on getting me to the answer I wanted, yeah. which is about <laughs> Bitcoin and you got there. It took yeah. a little while. <laughs> So you see a lot of promise for Bitcoin in the coming years to actually be more than a store of value, to have more um, use cases, more functionality? Yeah, so the like I said, Bitcoin is money, and money primarily has three use cases. There's that store of value, which is the first and most important. There is a medium of exchange, which we're gonna see, uh, like the example of Nigeria, it's being used really uh, effectively as a medium of exchange over there. And then the last one is a unit of account, which I think we're a little ways away from. Nobody's really pricing anything in Bitcoin yet. But I think in the coming years, we're going to see a lot more of that move from uh, Bitcoin being solely a store of value to being also a medium of exchange. Okay. And that's going to be driven by need around the world, just like it is in Nigeria. Okay. Very interesting. Well, thanks. You're being also quite, quite clear and succinct. Uh, I want to talk about jobs. Uh, I was talking with uh, my assistant last night and asking him uh, his thoughts, and he was actually quite curious to know. So I guess the question is, what are the jobs in crypto, probably in Bitcoin for, from your point of view? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and where are those jobs? And maybe a little bit on how to prepare for someone like Adam, for example, who may want to enter the market in four or five years. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I would, say, I would start by saying, like you said, stick with the Bitcoin jobs. Um, <laughs> 
there's a lot of jobs in the crypto space broadly, and there's a lot of money in there that's flowing around that they were able to uh, to take in from these illegal securities offerings. But everyone that I've ever known who's gone to work for one of those companies gets burned in the end because they're not long-term thinkers. They d if they were long-term thinkers, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have done an ICO. They wouldn't have built these pointless platforms. And it's very common that the employees of these companies are left holding the bag on a couple paychecks at the end of the 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 company or the foundation or whatever melts down so uh caution in that sense um in terms of looking for bitcoin jobs uh the number one thing is really developers software engineers and you know software engineers can work anywhere so that's a great path to take but a specialization in blockchain bitcoin those things can add like just a little bit of extra value that can open some doors in that what sense. What if you're interested in uh, sales and marketing, for example, or? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're creating a lot of jobs in sales and marketing as well, for sure. Yeah. Um, those are not unique skills to the industry, though. Those are just, you know, we, we need salespeople that know how to sell, not necessarily salespeople that are Bitcoin experts. But I guess if they do, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where everybody's going to adopt Bitcoin at some point, yeah. and some people will adopt it when they have to, and some people will adopt it ahead of that when they when they want to or they find it interesting. And so, no matter what um, walk of life you're in, no matter what your career takes you, you know you're going to be at a massive advantage if you get in on Bitcoin sooner rather than later. And it is very risky not to own any Bitcoin. Like you can be left at the back of the bus and and holding the bag on all these dollars, and I don't think anybody wants to be there. And so. that's your most important message probably today. How can people then get involved? We just talked about, you know, the future generation, but there's, you know, other people on this planet. So what about, yeah, yeah. you know, people that are already working, that have a job, perhaps don't necessarily want to work for the industry, but maybe want to familiarize themselves and maybe experience it a bit more. Yeah, really. I mean, uh, the number one thing is participating in the community. I would say there's a huge community in Canada, uh, both around Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, go to the events check out uh, podcasts. There's a couple great local uh, Canadian podcasts. One I'd recommend is called BTC Sessions, mm. local guy based in Calgary here, uh, Bitcoin only content. And, and that's sort of where I would start by dipping your foot in. And it's, it's dangerous because it's a rabbit hole and it'll end up sucking up all your other hobbies and your whole life. <laughs> and you won't do, you'll be that guy who just like shows up at a party and won't stop talking about crypto, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you might be educating people and yeah. perhaps saving the world, right? Um, I have to ask you, especially as a, as a Bitcoin maxi, if I can call you like that, where will Bitcoin be at the end of 2022? And let's say in two years, and let's say by 2030. Uh, where will it be in what sense? In, in <laughs> dollar pr sense. Price? Okay. <laughs> Very much, US um, dollar sense. Yeah, I mean, if I knew what it was gonna do, I definitely wouldn't tell you. Um, I would just trade on that information, but it's, uh, it's going to go up in the long term and it's going to be wild in the meantime. That's the only thing that I can really predict. Okay. And we're probably going to run much like we have the last, like, I don't know, however many bull bear cycles. We're going to hit a catalyst of some kind, uh, whether it's institutional adoption, corporate balance sheets, uh, you know, uh, third world adoption, all the stuff that we're seeing now. There's probably something that we haven't even thought of will happen. And all of a sudden we're going to see a massive rise. We're going to probably get a rise to several hundred thousand dollars and then it's gonna crash and it's gonna be back to a bear market and then we're gonna do it all over again. And every time it rises, right. it beats the past all time high and every time it crashes, it crashes to what would have otherwise seemed like a very high number. So if I was to draw previously. it, you imagine kind of this. Yeah. Right, okay, very interesting. And uh, final question, your key message is pretty clear around Bitcoin and its value and, and, and the message to the community. Um, I'd like to just ask you a Canadian question. What's the most Canadian thing about Bitcoin and about the market, whether it be an event or a trait or, or something that we do here? Yeah, well, I think part of the reason that we've got such a large uh, adoption number in Canada for Bitcoin is because it's, it's a very um, individualistic technology and we're, you know, being such a large country, very spread out population, um, we're not like, we don't have a centralized identity the way that a lot of countries do. And so I think Canadians are probably a lot more likely to have money under the mattress than Americans. Canadians are more likely to be a little more independent thinking. And I think that leads down that path to getting into Bitcoin. So that, that'd be how I would characterize Bitcoin as Canadian. I and think. is that especially true here in Alberta? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do Certainly. You want to say a few words about Alberta's potential in the in the Bitcoin market? Yeah, absolutely. I think Alberta is uh, is potentially the spot to be for a Bitcoin company right because now. We just had uh, Bitcoin uh, Bitcoiner Daniel Smith elected premier as a premier. Yeah. And uh, that's a big thing. We have massive reserves of natural gas, which are being used for mining. 
and we have some of the top companies in the world headquartered here. And so taxes are pretty good too. Yeah, the, the tax taxes are low, and uh, on top of that, we have a little bit more reasonable securities commission here. And you know, we we had a consultation with the province a couple of years ago, and we identified banking, insurance, and securities regulations as the three biggest things that we needed to solve to get companies into Alberta, and. We have the start of the solution to all of those things coming together now in Alberta. So it's coming together. Um, I hope someday that uh, we're going to have uh, Bitcoin on the balance sheet for the province of Alberta. That's right. a, a big step that... Mm. Uh, Seems that much more real with a Bitcoin or Premier. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so. I'd like to end this interview by saying yeehaw. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much, Dave. So Thanks. I'm here with Dave Bradley from Bitcoin Well, who obviously speaks his mind, and we love that. Still very <laughs> positive and constructive here at the Canadian Blockchain Summit in Calgary. Thank you, and make sure to watch the next videos.